the family of First Baptist Church, Indian Trail, welcomes you. Join with Senior Pastor Dr. Mike Whitson as we present Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church, Indian Trail. No matter what you've got going on in your life today, in His presence, troubles vanish, problems cease, broken hearts can be mended. And we sing this song as a prayer to Him today. Holy Spirit, you're welcome. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare your unending love. Your presence, Lord. I taste it. 
years ago um, came across a book by Jim Cimbala kind of just changed my whole prayer life uh, got a little nugget out of that book it was a great book great testimony of his family but it, there was one takeaway for me out of the book and it was the fact that the Holy Spirit yearns for our fellowship he yearns for <clears throat> us to spend time together and acknowledge him as a person. And I'd always just thought about the Holy Spirit being uh, a force that helps. I knew as a person, but just to empower and strengthen those kinds of things. I, I didn't. I never realized that just as much as God the Father yearns for our attention, and God the Son loves us when we're in His presence, so does the Holy Spirit love us. And it really just changed my whole prayer life and communing with him. And so we do welcome the presence of the Holy Spirit here uh, this morning. So let's join together in prayer. Father, thank you for uh, the time that we have here this morning to worship you. Uh, we thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on a cross, uh, to shed his rich, red, royal, innocent blood to cover our sins. I thank you that when he went away back into heaven, he said we would not be without strength, we would not be without comfort, that you'd send the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, to come alongside of us. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you here today. I pray that even now that you would be convicting the lost of their lostness. Lord, that you would be pointing people to Jesus for those that are hurting and grieving I pray that you would comfort them for those that are looking for some help to get through some tough times in their life I pray that you would strengthen them and give them the wisdom that can only come from you get glory in everything that's said and done here today for it's in Jesus name I pray 
Amen. Thank you. Be seated. A number of years ago, I came across uh, a, a fellow that uh, became dear friends of mine and Kathy's, uh, Mark and Beth Harris. Beth, you know, I, I didn't earlier, but why don't you stand? Because, you know, sometimes our wives kind of get lost. And Beth, thank you for coming and being with us today. You know, I could talk a long time about our relationship with Mark and how God has just uh, brought our hearts and, and mended them together as friends. Uh, but let me just say this. He is a modern-day Abraham uh, who stepped away, and everybody's wondering, you know, Mark, why did you leave the ministry? Well, he hadn't left the ministry. God's call is without repentance. God's call is without revocation. But once in a while, God redirects us uh, along the way. And uh, right now, you know, <laughs> to step away from the security of a pastorate, to go into an unknown area. You don't really know what the outcome is going to be, but you just know God says this is what I want you to do is one of the most admirable traits I think that any man, regardless of whether it's a pastor or a layman, any man could possess. And so, Mark, we welcome you to First Baptist Church. Thank you for coming and sharing the word uh, with us today. And, and just uh, for, for some of you that may want to be critical about today, uh, this, this is not a political rally. This is a Jesus rally. And nobody is invited to this pulpit that does not preach the word of God. So we invite Mark Harris today.
I mean to tell you, to think, just think about that fact that uh, when mercy is extended, the broken are mended and his presence fills this place. Well, it is a, a pleasure for me to be here this morning and uh, my thanks to your dear pastor, Mike Whitson, good friend, uh, for the invitation to come and, and preach the word this morning. And it is certainly always an honor to be here at First Baptist Indian Trail. I just find myself rejuvenated every time I have the opportunity to worship here. And uh, your music is a huge part of that. And uh, would you give the choir another hand? Just thank the Lord for them and for their incredible ministry as they just fill this place each and every week uh, with the worship and just lifting up and honoring the Lord. I was here last month for Brother Mike's 35th anniversary, and I'll tell you, I was excited this morning in the first service, and now to see it the second, I think he's off to a great start for the next 35. What do you think about that? And uh, he's got a great start to do 35 more here in this place. I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Nehemiah. Brother Mike mentioned Nehemiah chapter 2, and I want you to turn there, if you will, for just a moment as we have an opportunity to look into God's Word and want to share together here in this passage an important passage that really became a life verse, life verses, if you will, in my own life. It was in the fall of 2011 when I was visited by some folks who began to share with me of something that was happening in our own state called the Marriage Amendment here in North Carolina. And in the process of having that conversation, many of you remember that we were asked as citizens of this state to go to the polls and actually vote on whether or not we define marriage as being between a man and a woman. That still is astounding to me that we actually were put in a position of having to do that. But the reality is that we did. And 61% of the people in North Carolina said that they believe marriage is between a man and a woman and should be part of our Constitution. Well, in the midst of that and leading up to that time, and I, I was asked to be engaged and involved in that process, and as I really began to pray about what role the Lord would have me to play, I was preaching a series at the time through the book of Nehemiah and was taken specifically to this passage on that very afternoon of that meeting. Now, to make sure you understand the context of Nehemiah, you've got to understand in 586 B.C., that Nebuchadnezzar and his troops literally came into the city of Jerusalem and they didn't just conquer the city of Jerusalem, they flattened the city of Jerusalem and decimated it greatly. They took the wall that had surrounded that great city for protection and they broke it down and they burned the gates with fire. Now with that wall down, thieves and foreign invaders made it a common practice to come in and out of the city of Jerusalem at will and to rape and to pillage the land. Now fast forward, if you will, 142 years later. A man named Nehemiah is serving as cupbearer to the king. And in the midst of serving as cupbearer to the king, friends from his homeland come to meet with Nehemiah and they report to him of just how bad things have gotten in Jerusalem. In fact, it so impacted Nehemiah that I believe that if a clinical psychologist would have been meeting with Nehemiah, he would have diagnosed him of having gone into a depression. You say, why would you say that, Mark? Because the truth of the matter is the word of God actually says that it affected his countenance. It so rattled Nehemiah that it changed the way he looked. It changed everything about him to the extent that when Nehemiah went to serve the king as cupbearer, he actually found the king asking him, Nehemiah, what's happened to you? Something's gone wrong. I notice that you don't have that smile on your face that you once had. I notice you don't have that kick in your step that you once had. What, what is the burden that you're carrying? Nehemiah began to explain to the king what had happened and what report he had heard from Jerusalem. Well, the king loved Nehemiah, and he said, well, what, what can I do for you? And by the time you get to chapter 2, Nehemiah has taken the leave of absence from, from the role of cupbearer, and he has arrived in Jerusalem, and in the beginning of chapter 2, he is now prayer walking around that city of Jerusalem. 
Now, you know what a prayer walk does. How many of you have ever done a prayer walk? Raise your hand. You know what I'm talking about. When you prayer walk around an area, it is for you to observe that area, to ask God to open your eyes to what's happening in that area, and then for you to literally pray and cry out to God for the burdens he places on your heart about what you are seeing with your own eyes. And you know what Nehemiah found? When he surveyed the city of Jerusalem and prayer walked that city, he found that it was far worse than he had even been told. He found it was far worse than his mind could even have imagined. And the Bible says that Nehemiah wept. And let me just tell you something. The word that's used there in the Hebrew for wept doesn't mean just to shed a tear. It means that he literally wept from the deepest part of his soul. He wailed and cried out to God. He wept and he wept and he wept till there were no more tears to flow. Now, by the way, can I just say an aside right here? I've had the opportunity of traveling across our state and and being in churches and talking to people in churches now for some 30 years. I hear a lot of people that talk about the state of the condition in our country. I hear people all the time that talk about their concern for what's happening in the culture. I hear people complain every day. I hear people bellyache about the situation every day. I hear people say something's got to give. And I even hear people say, Mark, we are headed to hell in a handbasket. But the one thing that I fail to hear oftentimes is I fail to hear the people of God literally weeping for the condition of our nation. That's what's missing. So many of us say we want revival. So many of us say we want another awakening. And yet we still fail to come in a true broken state so moved and so broken that it brings us to weep. And I'm just going to promise you something. You can talk till the cows come home, but until your heart is ever really broken, that you weep over the state of affairs in the nation, you will not see the spiritual awakening that you claim you want to see. Now the good part about Nehemiah weeping Till he couldn't weep anymore, is it meant that he had come to the end of himself. And by the way, that's a good place to be. It means that he had come to the end of his rope. He had come to the end of himself. And and the reason that's a good thing is when you and I finally come to the end of ourselves, when you and I finally come to the end of our rope, that's when God does his greatest work. That's when God begins to show himself mighty. And that's exactly what you find in chapter 2 of Nehemiah in verse 17 and 18. Because when Nehemiah came to the end of himself, God spoke and gave him a vision for what needed to happen. And as God moved and gave him that vision for what needed to happen, Nehemiah then shared it with the people. And guess what? A miracle took place. And we'll talk about that miracle in just a moment. I want you to stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God. I want you to look at Nehemiah chapter 2. We're just going to read two verses together, and then we're going to move into the message. Then I said to them, this is the vision now. God's given Nehemiah, and he's delivering it to the people. Then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste, and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach or actually a word embarrassment is a good word there. And I told them of the hand of my God which had been good upon me and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. Father, I just pray in the mighty name of Jesus that in these very moments that you would move on our hearts to hear your voice, to hear your word, and that indeed, Lord, that today our eyes would be open to see only that that you can provide vision for, that our ears would be open to hear only that that your spirit can provide the understanding of. And Father, I just pray that in these moments that our hearts would simply be open to the very prompting of your spirit in this place. 
And Lord, I just pray personally that you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I want you to notice that there's a three-part vision that God gives Nehemiah and Nehemiah then delivers the vision to the people, which ultimately led to the miracle that we'll get to here in just a moment. If you're a note taker this morning, let me invite you to notice, number one, that Nehemiah, the vision God gave him was to help the people recognize the emergency. Recognize the emergency. In fact, I want you to underline verse 17 at the very first line, if you will. Then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. The very first thing that Nehemiah comes out of his mouth in the vision he delivers to the people is you've got to help them recognize the emergency that they're in. You see, if you were to look up the word emergency in a dictionary today, or you were to take your smartphone and you were to type in an emergency for a definition, you would find that a definition that would be something like this, a situation or an event that will require immediate action. Now, when we see an emergency, ladies and gentlemen, we know it, do we not? I mean, listen, if a few minutes ago when we were standing and lifting our voices to the Lord in praise and worship, if suddenly you had looked down the row where you're sitting and someone would have turned ash and gray, that same person would have then clasped their chest and then you would have watched them slump over the chair in front of them. How many of you here would have recognized we had an emergency on our hands? Raise your hand if you would have seen that. Of course you would have recognized it. And, and, and you would have done what? Well, Mark, we would have leapt into action. Of course you would. Someone would have immediately pulled out a cell phone and dialed 911. Someone else would have immediately grabbed that individual and tried to catch them before they collapsed over the chair in front of them. Someone would have immediately, if that person had quit breathing, stretched them out on the floor. And someone, no doubt in a crowd this size, would know how to do CPR. And you would begin CPR on that individual. Why is that? Because when we recognize an emergency, we spring into action. But here's when the problem comes. Once we've been lulled to sleep and we're no longer paying attention, then we no longer recognize the emergency that we're in. There's a word for that. The word is desensitized. Desensitized. See, that's what had happened in Jerusalem. They had become desensitized. Remember how long I had told you it had been from the time Nebuchadnezzar came in and flattened the city till the time that Nehemiah shows up on the scene? 142 years. Now, if you believe a generation is 40 years, then we're talking about three and a half generations had passed. And the people had just determined that this is just the way it's going to be. Things, this is the way it's always been. It's not going to get any better than this. And they had become desensitized to what was happening in the city of God. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there was a term that was introduced in our American culture back in 2009 under the Obama administration. The term first surfaced and the media picked up on it and began to spread it far and wide, speaking specifically to the economic situation in our country. After the downturn in our economy, the worst since the Great Depression, they said. And the new term that was introduced has been used over and over again. Some of you will remember it when I say it, but you really didn't hear this term prior to 2009. What, it, what is the word that the, me, the words that the media took and uh, introduced that term and has continued to build on it? How many of you here have ever heard the term the new normal? Raise your hand. You've heard that, haven't you? The new normal. And that was what was introduced to us. And again, it was introduced in the idea of an economic situation where they said, listen, this is just the way it's going to be. Things won't ever get any better. They began to tell us, don't expect GDP to grow beyond 1% or 2% because this is just the new normal and it's just not going to get any better than this anymore. But then the problem is the media took that line and began to continue to build on it. 
They begin to say to you, look, you may believe that killing a baby in an unborn baby in a mother's womb is wrong, but look, we've already killed 60 million of them, and you can keep talking about uh, defunding Planned Parenthood. You can keep talking about overturning Roe versus Wade, but the reality is we've killed 60 million already. We'll kill 60 million more because why? Because that's the new normal. You might as well just get over it. And then they told us when we passed the marriage amendment in this state, 61 to 39%, a few months later, a federal judge with a stroke of a pen simply said that was unconstitutional, which led ultimately to a decision that was called Obergefell, where five uh, lawyers in robes in the United States Supreme Court decided one day that they were going to make law rather than interpret the law and came down with a decision that said marriage can be whatever you want it to be. It can be between a man and a man. It can be between a woman and a woman. And God help us in the slippery slope that we are now upon, whatever anybody else may say. But they look at us and they say, that's the new normal. Just get used to it. Get over it. And if anybody had told me in 2005 when I came to pastor First Baptist Church Charlotte that my study would literally, my desk is 100 yards from the Charlotte City Council Chamber, literally across the street, 100 yards, a football field away, that the Charlotte City Council would actually pass an ordinance that said that a man can go into a woman's restroom or a woman can go into a man's restroom all depending on how they feel on any given day. If you had told me that was going to happen over the years while I was pastor of First Baptist Charlotte, I would have looked at you like you had two heads. But it did. It did. And they began to look at us and say, you just need to get over it. That's the new normal. Well, ladies and gentlemen, they can call it a new morality. They can call it a new normal. But I stand before you today to say, this is God's standard. This is God's normal. This is upon which we will stand. The word of the living God. This is where we stand. And it is so important to open our eyes and recognize the emergency that we face. Nehemiah said, just look around you. See the distress that we are in. How Jerusalem lies in waste. Its gates, walls are torn down. Its gates are burned with fire. But the second thing he said to them, is not only do you need to recognize the emergency, you must rely upon God for his power and his presence. Boy, I just have to tell you, when I heard the choir singing that special moment ago before I got up here, my heart was just leaping within me. I mean, was that not an awesome message that they were singing? His pre- Can I just tell you something today? God's power and God's presence changes everything. Do you believe that? Do you believe that with all of your heart? His presence, his presence and his power change everything. They can change everything in an individual's life. They can change everything in the life of a state or a community. They can change everything in the life of a church. They, it, listen, his presence and his power changes everything in a nation. Nehemiah said, we're going to have to rely upon God. You said, Mark, where do you see that in this passage? Look at verse 18. It said, and I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me. Boy, I love that phrase right there. You know why? Because as I told you a moment ago, Nehemiah was cupbearer to the king, right? I mean, there was a little risky a little risk to that job. I mean, you, you were tasting stuff to make sure nobody was trying to poison the king. And for some of you, that would be a little beyond the pale in terms of risk. But outside of the risk, it was a great gig. I'm just going to tell you it was. I mean, you got to live in the king's palace. You got to eat at the king's table. You got to have the relationship with the king. And outside of the risk, it was awesome. But I promise you this, if you had gone to shake Nehemiah's hand, it would have been the softest hand you had probably ever shake. And you say, why? Because there's no indication. Nehemiah had ever done a full day's work of physical labor in his life. You say, what's your point? My point is Nehemiah didn't have a clue of how to mix mortar. 
Nehemiah didn't have a clue how to lay a brick or a block. Nehemiah didn't have a clue how to pull a plumb line. And yet this was the very man that God would touch and say, I'm going to use him to rebuild the great wall of Jerusalem and rebuild that city. Why in the world? Let me tell you something. Nehemiah makes it clear when he said, I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me. Nehemiah's message was consistent and it was simple. He said, it's not me. It's not my gifts. It's not my abilities. It's not my intellect. It's not my in." Ingenuity. It's what God does that ultimately makes the difference in all of this because his presence and his power changes it all. And I'm here to tell you this morning, you could have had the great architect of the Great Wall of China. You could have had the builders and the planners of the greatest skyscrapers that dot the skylines of the most beautiful cities in America. None of them could have ever done the job Nehemiah did for one reason and one reason alone. The hand of God was all over Nehemiah's life. And that's what made the difference. Can I just tell you something? That's great news for every man and woman under the sound of my voice this morning, whether you're here or whether you're watching by live stream. Because the very same hand of God that rested on Nehemiah's life that brought about all these things that happened is the same hand of God that wants to rest on your life today. This is the same hand of God that can take you wherever you are and begin to do awesome things in your life. Listen, I meet so many people every day that, that are just so discouraged, so ready to give up, so ready to throw in the towel. If I've been asked once, I've been asked a dozen times, Mark, would, why in the world would you be doing what you're doing? Our nation's gone too far. It's far too gone. Why would you even try to invest yourself in, in that kind of thing? And I've said, look, I've just got to be obedient to God's call. And I got to tell you, the word of God says that I read that all things are possible with God. I don't believe we've gone too far. I believe that we're at a point where God wants to move. But I also recognize that we've got to be willing to surrender ourselves and submit ourselves to Him. You see, there's some of you this morning that you're, you could hardly, you, nobody else in this room may even know this about you, but it took everything you have to put one foot in front of the other this morning. You're struggling. Nobody may know it. You came to church with a smile on your face. But internally, things are in a tragic mess. And God wants to say to you today, I've got you. I want you to hold your finger here in Nehemiah for a moment and flip over to Isaiah 43. Because in Isaiah 43, there's some of you this morning that, that this passage is just for you that I want to give you as an encouragement to you today. In Isaiah 43, it says, But now, thus says the Lord, verse 1, just the first three verses of Isaiah 43, But now, thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel. Now look what he says to him. You ready for this? Fear not. Whew. We don't have to fear. For I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. Woo, that's good news, isn't it? How many of you are excited God knows your name today? You're not just a number to God. You're not just a hey you to God. Even in church, you know, you know how we do it. When we don't know somebody's name, we say, hey brother, hey sister. We're not even brother and sister to God. He knows us by name. He knows your name. He knows every hair on your head. He said, I know, listen. He said, I have called you by your name. You are mine. Now look at verse 2. Here's the promise. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And look at this next phrase. Nor shall the flame scorch you. In other words, that means you're not even going to smell like smoke. Why? Verse 3. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Can I just say something to somebody that's listening to me this morning who's ready to throw in the towel? Can, can I just say to you, you may feel like the rivers have been rising on you. You may say, preacher, if you knew what's going on in my life, you, you, you would understand better. Let me tell you something. You may feel like the water's right here to your thighs and every foot 
every leg you lift, you feel like there's a hundred pound weight on it. There may be some of you say, preacher, that, I'm, I'm much worse off than that. I feel like the water in that river is up to my chest. And I can barely get my breath because the weight on my chest is overwhelming me. And there's someone here that's even willing to say to me, perhaps this morning, preacher, if you only knew my condition, if you only knew my situation, I've got my head tilted back because the water is right here to my chin. And, and I feel like that I'm going to go under at any moment. Can I just tell you, whether the water's here, whether the water's here, or whether the water's right here, Isaiah 43, God promises you that river will not overtake you he's got you in the palm of his hand and that's all that matters he's got you and for those of you that are thinking about that fire you're going through this morning let me just tell you you're not going to be burned in the midst of that fire in fact he says you won't even be scorched you say mark i'm not sure i really believe that then you just need to talk to three buddies of mine shadrach meshach and abednego you remember those three Hebrew boys? You remember they were put in the fiery furnace and you remember the king looked in there, the same king, and he said, wait a minute, I know there were three that I put in there, but I count one, two, three, now there's four. And you and I know that that fourth man in the fire is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the fourth man in the fire. He always has been. He always is. And he always will be the fourth man in the fire. Listen, there's not an issue that you're facing in your life. There's not an issue for that matter that we're facing in this nation. That God's presence and God's power will not change it all. It's true. He's given us his answers right here. The question is, do we believe that? And do we believe that enough to fight for it? And to stand up for it? Recognize the emergency, Nehemiah said. Rely upon God's power, his presence. But there's one last thing, and I'll leave you with this. Look what he said. The third thing is that they needed to be relentless in their efforts. Did you get that? It's one thing to recognize the emergency and say, yes, things are bad. It's another to say, we're going to rely upon God and call prayer meetings and, and seek the face of God and, and seek his presence and power. But there's a third piece to this, and they had to be relentless I call it relentless obedience is the call. In fact, when you go back to the middle of verse 17, you, you find Nehemiah as he's delivering this vision God's given him. You see where he says, come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach or, or an embarrassment. Nehemiah was not only a great leader, but Nehemiah, I think, had a lot of the same personality traits of a, of a great football coach. You say, what do you mean, Mark? I, I just picture Nehemiah when he gets to this part, kind of getting down on his knees, eyeball to eyeball, with the, with the people of Jerusalem who were gathered in Jerusalem Square. And can't you just hear Nehemiah now saying, come on, y'all. He was from southern Jerusalem, so that's the way he would have said it. <laughs> come on, y'all. Let's rebuild these walls. And you know, by the time you get to the end of verse 18, look what it says. It said, the people said, let us rise up and build. And they strengthened their hands to this good work. You said, Mark, you mentioned a miracle. Oh, yeah, I did, didn't I? What couldn't get done in 142 years. When they recognized the emergency, relied upon God and His power, and the people were relentlessly obedient, what couldn't be done in 142 years got accomplished in 52 days. 
Let me ask you something. Do you really think nobody in 142 years noticed that those walls were down? Huh? Do you think nobody in 142 years complained about it? Do you think nobody in 142 years went to a town hall meeting and said, somebody better do something about those walls. Thieves and foreign invaders are coming in and out. Of land. Do you think that never happened? Of course it happened. Then what made the difference? It took the power and presence of God and the passion and leadership of a Nehemiah who was sold out. And it took the people who were willing to join their hands together and get it done by the power of his spirit. That's what made the difference. You see, I meet a lot of people who say, Mark, so many risks, so much sacrifice, just makes no logical sense for you to do what you're doing. Believe me, I'm the first to know that. But I answered his call the first time to leave a law school commitment. To enter the pulpit so I know what his call is and as Beth and I have prayed seeking his leadership with a window of opportunity quickly closing to turn this nation around I know what this call is and I have to be relentlessly obedient to that call you see, there was a man in history that you may not have heard of named Jonas Clark. I ask people oftentimes, you know Jonas Clark, and no, never heard of Jonas Clark. Then I say, well, how many of you have ever heard of Paul Revere? And in fact, how many of y'all have ever heard of Paul Revere? Raise your hand. Yeah, everybody's hands go up. Well, where was Paul Revere riding that night when he was saying, the British are coming, the British are coming? I'll tell you where he was writing. He was writing to the home of Jonas Clark. Well, who's Jonas Clark? Oh, Jonas Clark. He's just a pastor. Ah. Well, why in the world was he writing to the home of Pastor Jonas Clark? To say the British are coming to British. Oh, I, I'll tell you why. Because there were two men sitting at Pastor Clark's kitchen table that night. You've probably heard of Samuel Adams. And you've probably heard of John Hancock. Those two men were sitting at Pastor Clark's kitchen table. Well, why in the world were they there? They were there that night to tell Pastor Jonas Clark, Pastor, tonight's the night. Are you ready for this? To which Pastor Jonas Clark simply said, Gentlemen, yes. But not only am I ready for this, I have prepared my congregation for this very moment. Now let me tell you why that was such a courageous statement. Because if you had done a CNN or a Fox News or a Reuters poll of the colonies at that particular time, you know what you would have found? You would have found that only 30% of the colonists polled actually were in favor of a war for independence, for liberty, and for our freedom. So that means every week when Pastor Clark spoke to his church in New England, for every 10 set of eyes that were looking at him, seven sets of those eyes were opposed to everything he said and everything he was standing for. But this man had such character such consistency and such courage that he never backed down. And by the way, I hope before your head hits the pillow tonight, somewhere in it, that you'll thank God for pastors. You got one of them in Dr. Mike Whitson, who are men of character, consistency, and courage. 
Because had it not been for pastors like Jonas Clark, I dare say none of us would be sitting here today doing what we are doing, enjoying the freedom and religious liberty that we experience today. Thank God for those pastors. Because there there have been times in our nation's history where those men of God have had to step to the forefront and say, now is the time. You see, the question of this hour is not for me. The question of this hour is for you. Beth and I settled last July what he's called us to do. Today, it's really about what's he calling you to do? What's he calling you to do? What does it mean for you to be relentlessly obedient? Relentlessly obedient to the Spirit of God. Would you bow your heads right where you are, please? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed all over this sanctuary. I don't know what the Lord is saying to you this morning, but I'm just simply asking you to be obedient and to do that which he has asked you to do. We're living in very difficult times. We're living in times where I truly believe the window of opportunity for moving our nation could be quickly closing. And it's critically important for believers to be like the sons of Issachar, understanding the times in which we live. I'm asking you this morning, what's God saying to you? Maybe you've never entered into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, that's first and foremost. That's the first step of obedience for anyone is to know Christ as their Savior. To confess your sin. To recognize not only are you a sinner, but that He went to the cross. He gave everything, even His own life. He was buried. And three days later, he arose, claiming victory over sin, over death, and over the grave. You see, the invitation for you this morning that's most important is will you answer that call to salvation and be obedient to say, Lord, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and save me, please, today. Would you do that? That's the most important step. And then secondly, if you're here this morning and you're already a believer, you're a follower of Christ, I'm going to ask you, would you be willing to to just come get on this altar this morning? I, I don't know what God's asking you to do. I don't know what being relentlessly obedient means for you. But I wonder if you would come and get on this altar and settle it with him. Whatever he's asking you to do, would you come and trust him and just put it before him? Some of you may be led to join this church by baptism, by letter, by statement. Preacher Mike's going to be right here at the front and you can come and others will join you. But again, we have sensed the presence and the power of God's spirit in this place all morning. And I'm just asking you, would you respond? to his invitation to your heart. Father, guide us, help us hear your voice, and help us respond in faith and obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.